Was the German Empire the bad guy in the conflict? And was Kaiser Wilhelm II really the warmonger and madman he is often portrayed as? No. No, he wasn't the bad guy. No, he wasn't the madman he's portrayed as. Uh, Kaiser Wilhelm, uh, well, see, firstly, is you have several things going on at once, as you generally do in any historical issue. Germany, like Italy, had been cobbled together not all that long before. Uh, the German Empire was only unified in 1870. So we're talking, it had three sovereigns, one of whom, the Kaiser's father, only reigned for a matter of months. Uh, the Kaiser had come to power in 1888, a mere 18 years after the German Empire got started. So, and, and the Kaiser had several conflicting things going on in his own head. On the one hand, he was very pro-English. Queen Victoria was his grandmother, and he loved her dearly. She died in his arms. His mother was an English princess. Wow. Uh, and he spoke English with a British accent. He was very, very pro-English. But interestingly enough, uh, his uncle Edward, uh, Victoria's son, and he did not get on at all well, uh, which was not that surprising because Edward and his mother didn't get on well. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's funny how these things yeah. affect, and these resentments that you see in families, in you know, regular life, also occur in royal families, because royals are what's that word? Human beings. <laughs> I knew, I knew, I'd find it if I thought about it. They're human beings. So these things were in the air. He had a withered arm, and felt a huge need to prove himself. Also, a huge need to prove Germany, as the child among nations which led him to, shall we say, extravagances with somebody without something to prove might not have done. So there was a lot of posturing. But he was not really a warmonger. The proof of the pudding being that he pulled back from the edge of war time after time. Mm. Because he was quite aware that, you know, Germany, uh, like the rest of Europe, Germany, he was not keen on a general conflagration despite his saber rattling and his jumping up and down. That was meant to impress the British, was meant to impress his uncle and his cousin. But the proof of the pudding is that after the war broke out, he swiftly lost control of the country. And he was basically replaced by Hindenburg and Ludendorff. That, that's just the way it happened. How, how does one simply lose control? Well, country. one loses control of the country because the generals in charge are making all the decisions. And they defer to you, they bow their heads, but you've got nothing to tell them. They know what they're doing and you don't. That'll do it. Yep. We lost control over policy in World War I. Uh, the other thing about him is that, on the one hand, he very much believed in legitimate monarchy. But as I've said, the German Empire was very new and sort of artificial, and in itself a product of revolution against the Habsburgs. So he, there were a lot of contradictions in his head. Uh, was he a madman? No. Mm -hmm. um, he was a very decent individual. It's interesting that in a television movie called The Exception, which I can't recommend due to its uh, Game of Thrones-like uh, uh, moral standing, mm -hmm. nevertheless has Christopher Plummer play the Kaiser no. in a very, very sympathetic light. Because he was, after the war, he went to exile in the Netherlands. And he had this little exile court in Dorn to Utrecht. And when the Germans invaded the Netherlands, he was beside himself because they had given him a refuge. Yeah. So he refused the honor guard that the Nazis tried to give him and he wouldn't let the, he, in his funeral, he wouldn't allow them to have anything to do with it and so forth. Wow. Uh, he died in 41 while the Netherlands was still being occupied. One of his sons was pro-Nazi, August Wilhelm, but uh, the rest of them were very anti-Nazi. And in fact, his grandson, the son of the Crown Prince, uh, was vaguely connected to the Stauffenberg uh, coup. Ooh. So, anyway, that's the story with the Kaiser. Okay. Did the Pope actively take a side and what role did the papacy play during the war? No, he did not. Unlike World War II, where Pius XII was sometimes almost embarrassingly pro-allied, 
contrary to all the morons who talk about Hitler's Pope, uh, which shows you what little they know. Yeah. Benedict really was neutral, and there were reasons for this. Uh, the biggest part being that both sides had a lot of very pious Catholics on them, and neither side, with the exception of the French government, come also, was really anti-Catholic. So, you know, what do you do there? He uh, did try to bring about a peace settlement, but the only one to listen to him was the, um, the Blessed Emperor Charles of Austria. Of course. Everyone else, uh, the Kaiser to, to a, a, a much lesser degree, and everybody else knows in the air. Of course, forget Ludendorff and Hindenburg. They were both good Protestants anyway. Not unlike President Wilson, who was a, uh, an ordained Presbyterian minister. So, you know, he had no use for the Pope. <laughs> he had his own God. Yeah. Yeah. Moloch. No, no. <laughs> you know, ladies and gentlemen, wow. we didn't need that. Okay? Just, no. Don't say things like that. Anyway, what's, what's the next question? <laughs> Moloch. <laughs>